The following program is a Podcast One.com production. He started in a small town in Texas. Worked his ass off to become one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. We're going to take care of business tonight, and that's the bottom line. And now he's dominating the world of on-demand audio. And he's doing it for the working man. This is a damn good outlet for me to spew the bullshit off my brain. This is the Steve Austin Show. Unleashed. 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 All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I'm coming to you from the mean streets in Los Angeles, California today. Sitting here at the house at 317 Gimmick Street. The remodel continues over there at 316. Shit, we just got our electrical inspection done about an hour ago and everything passed with flying colors. That means the contractor can go in there with the drywall guys, skim all the damn walls, get them slicked down, get ready to put the floors in. Put all the damn frames around the doors that were reinstalling. They got all those uh, prepped and ready to go. Sling some paint on that motherfucker. Put the floors down, like I said. Uh, the three doors uh, to the exterior still got to go in. We're still about, man, I act like it's going to be done tomorrow, but it ain't. We still got shit. Maybe till April 1st, April 7th, before we get back in that damn place. God damn, shit, I told my wife, I probably told you guys on the podcast, I just said we should have just knocked the whole house down and started from scratch. But it's going good. I'll tell you what, man, when you tear down the walls, you start breaking in something like an old house that was built a long time ago or had some remodel stuff done to it, you start breaking in those walls, son of a bitch, my contractor calls us over there and shows us some stuff that had been jerry-rigged and fucked up and half-assed. Son of a bitch. I tell you what, I sure would like to kick a son bitch in the ass and remodel that son bitch or add it on to it back in the day because they didn't know what the fuck they was doing. And I don't think they cared either. If there's one thing I can't stand is when a motherfucker goes to remodel a house or add on and does shoddy, stupid work. So, shit, we're trying to remodel a goddamn house. I didn't know we was going to have to rebuild it. But I'll tell you what. If there's ever a hurricane up in this motherfucking state of California, everything else might fall in the water, but 316 Gimmick Street will be standing strong because we got that son of a bitch shored up like a motherfucker. I dare a damn hang on dare earthquake to come in and knock my house down and some bitch knowing my luck. Shit, probably would. I don't know. 2017, we're only two months in. I told you guys 2016 was kind of a suck ass year for the Austin family. So far, 2017, we're two months in, but I'm feeling pretty goddamn good about it. How's y'all's damn New Year going? Fuck, things are clipping along for the kid over here. Well, her, she had a little bit of a setback. That damn dog, she is 12 years old. She got in the trash can twice a couple days ago. She ate a bunch of egg yolks. When she ate those egg yolks, way back in the day, she had pancreatitis. An affliction of the liver. Not good. Damn near died. The vet down there in Jerdenton, Texas, right by the Broken Skull Ranch, saved her life with a bunch of IVs and antibiotics. Well, I'll be goddamn if eating those egg yolks didn't trigger that pancreatitis again. We hauled her ass to the vet. Shit. Got her on some medications. Came back. She's still limping along. She's doing a lot better, but she ain't out of the woods yet. She's still on the back end of having that walking pneumonia. We still got on antibiotics from that. And now I call her I call her a stubborn head because she's a goddamn stubborn. She's 12 years old. She knows she ain't supposed to get in the goddamn trash. And we feed her twice a day. So it ain't like she's missing any meals or starving. And she's a little bit on the heavy side, quite frankly. I don't want to say that too loud because she might hear me and get her feelings hurt. So I don't know why she felt she had to rustle around in the trash can and get in a bunch of damn egg yolks. Fuck. The other night, my wife was up all night long, taking her in and out because her, she would get in bed. She sleeps right at my feet in the bed. And we don't have a dog door over here at this place we're renting because it ain't our place. So my wife was up with her all night long and her, she'd get back in bed and my wife would pet on her. Well, her, she's stomach was all fucked up. She tried to go out there and, you know, do some business. My wife walked out there with her. Here comes Hershey back in. As soon as she laid down, two minutes later, 
right back out in the yard. And here's the thing. It was raining cats and dogs the whole night, so every time she comes in, my wife's got to dry her off, wipe her paws down, she gets back in bed, back outside. Well, I was awake the whole time this was going on, but my wife was handling the situation, so I figured, you know, what the fuck, you know, no, don't need two of us doing this. But I was up at the same time, so my wife was tired as a motherfucker the other day, and I was half tired because, you know, I was just listening to all the bullshit. So she has a good day, her she does. And then uh, I think she's starting to get out of the woods a little bit. And then last night, up about every 30 minutes, going back and forth to the bathroom. And we can't just leave the door open for her just because the house isn't shored up like our compound is over at 316. So there's my wife. I got up with her the first two times, and then from then on, it was all my wife. I'm laying there like a fucking idiot with my sleep apnea machine on thinking, God damn. It was, it was 3 o'clock this morning. I said, man, I'm about to make a damn Bloody Mary so I can go back to sleep. I didn't because I'm on a damn kick to get back in shape. I got some stuff coming up. want to be back in shape for me. So anyway, it ain't been nothing but chaos over here for a little bit over here at 317 Gimmick Street. But for the most part, 2017, we ain't but two months in, but it's going pretty good so far. Can't complain. Other good shit's happening. I wish her she would get her ass well, stay out of my trash can. Shit, we started putting a trash can on the counter. And then we said, fuck the counter. Now we put it in the garage and lock the door so she ain't got no hope of getting in that motherfucker. That damn stubborn-headed dog of mine. I don't know what I'm going to do with her. I love her to death. She's my baby. She goes everywhere with me. Well, she didn't go everywhere with me today. <sighs> I told you guys about the teeth cleaning session I had a couple months ago. Back to back Fridays to get all the shit off my teeth because for a couple years I kayfabe my wife on taking up all the dentist appointments she was trying to set for me. And then finally, I mean, she damn near held a gun to my head and said, you're going to the dentist. And when my wife gets that look on her face, she didn't really hold a gun to my head. I said, all right, I'll go to the dentist. And then I got met with those results, met with a report of what I needed to do, get my teeth right. And so I did all that shit, my due diligence, and got me an electric toothbrush. Fuck. So, 9 o'clock this morning, she had me an appointment. I got my ass up after, you know, staying up all night with her. She guzzled down my two cups of coffee, got my 2003 Ford Focus Metallic P, and drove over to the dentist's office. Got my teeth clean, polished up. Big thumbs up from a dentist. He goes, Steve, you're doing a damn good job. Wait, well, didn't say that. He's too nice of a guy. He says, Steve, you're doing an excellent job with your teeth. Keep flossing. So, hey, if I'm 52 years old and I just got my teeth clean, if I can give you any goddamn tips, brush your choppers twice a day, floss. Hey, and the, the dental hygienist was telling me how to floss. She goes, I'm going to show you how to floss. And this was a new dental hygienist who'd never been there before. So I'm, thinking, I'm sitting there thinking, all right, so she's going to show me how to floss. And she's flossing my teeth. And she goes, you got to wrap the dental floss around the side of your tooth so that you can scrape off the enamel or the plaque or the shit, the tartar that gets in there. I was like, okay. You know, that was the one part of it that I wasn't getting because I just put the dental floss up and down my teeth just to get all the chicken breasts or steak or rice or mashed potatoes out of my damn teeth. So now you got to wrap that string around there to scrape those some bitches properly. So you just heard it from a global icon and a national treasure. Take your damn ass down to Walgreens, Walmart, CVS, wherever you got to go. Get yourself some damn... Uh, dental floss and take care of your teeth. You're going to be over there getting your teeth scraped off and clean like me six months ago. Motherfucker. Hey, man, enough about all the damn nickel and dime shit I got going on. Hell, I was sitting there reading uh, on the sports section that Steve Sarkeesian is going to go to the Atlanta Falcons and be the offensive coordinator. Shit, he just signed up with Alabama, my team. Shit. I don't know what's going on over there. Shit, I'll tell you what, that Lane Kiffin shit the bed when they played Washington. Dan, you know, Alabama should have won that game a lot better than they did, and that's with respect to Washington because I like that program and I like that head coach. Kiffin called a shit game. He goes down to FAU, and they bring Sark in, who's been a, a offensive analyst while Kiffin was doing his thing, and they bring him in to call that last game against Clemson, and they got their heads thumped. And so now Sarkeesian's bolting from the tide, and going over to the Falcons. God damn. I don't know about this. It might be a blessing in disguise for the Crimson Tide. And man, for Atlanta Falcons, 
you know, it's going to be a hard job to replace Kyle Shanahan. And I don't know the Sarks guy. So I'll tell you what, as explosive as that Atlanta Falcons offense was last year with all those weapons, Matt Ryan really just keeps coming along, coming along, MVP of the season. You know, they shit the bet on that game. You know, some people call it a choke. I don't know what you'd call it. I think you saw a legend in Tom Brady re resurrect that damn uh, Patriots spark and just keep going on to win that game. But I'll tell you what, what the fuck? Sarkeesian is the offense coordinator. That's going to be an interesting thing to see. And like I said, we'll see who Alabama puts in his place. Roll Tide. Hey, man, let's get on with the son bitch here and move on. My guest today is an old acquaintance. We can't say he's like an old buddy because we never really hung around together, but we always have respect for each other. Paul Roma. You'll hear the story of how me and Paul got reconnected uh, after so many years. Paul stopped uh, professional wrestling in about 1998. And at that time, I was running pretty hot in WWF. And, uh, but we had had several matches together down in WCW. And one time, I believe it was at the Center Stage TV tapings, might have been uh, Florida. But me and Lord Stephen Regal, who was filling in for an injured Brian Pillman, hell, we lost our world tag titles to Paul Roma and Arn Anderson. And uh, me and Paul had singles matches and stuff like that. And we always had a good time, man, every time we worked together. And he's a good dude. So we got reconnected. And uh, he's on the podcast today. He's going to shoot the breeze and uh, go down memory road with Paul. He's running a wrestling school up there in Connecticut. He'll drop some 411 on that. And uh, Paul's done a million interviews and kind of wanted to do talk about some things other than some of the things that he's talked about on the podcast and the shoot interviews that he's done. So I had a real good time reconnecting with him. He's got a school over there. Uh, Paul was always a real solid worker, real gr very good mechanic in the ring, great working punch, very athletic, jump on the ropes like a cat, uh, good pacing, never rushed anything. Dude was solid as shit. So I tell you what, man, it's like I tell him in a podcast. I thought the Power and Glory tag team bad had a chance for a major run. And I just thought that they didn't get behind that enough. I don't know what the reasons were, but that was one of my favorite tag teams that they had going on way back in the day. Because Paul, I think, is about five or six years older than me. And I loved uh, Ray Hernandez, Hercules. They put those two guys together. And, of course, you know, when I first started getting WWF TV, that's when I remember him and Jim Powers as a young stallion. It was a pretty good little tag team back then. And each of them well, were kind of coming into their own. Obviously, there were some problems there in the team. You've heard about them before probably. You'll talk about them briefly here. But when he hooked up with, uh, with Ray as Hercules uh, for Power and Glory, I really thought – WWF should put the gas pedal on those guys. But anyway, enough of me flapping my gums about it. He's on the show today, and we're going to talk to him and see what he's up to, talk to him about his wrestling school. But before I get to Paul Roma, i got an important favor to ask you all before we really get going. I'm just going to jump in and tell you what's up. I'm able to do this podcast for you free twice a week thanks to all the great sponsors. And to make sure this podcast stays free and we keep the commercials to a minimum, please help a brother out by taking a short survey at podcastone.com slash my survey. It will take less than five minutes of your time and it's completely anonymous. And again, it'll really help me and this show out. It'll make sure we get the right sponsors and that we keep the ads to a minimum. That's podcastone.com slash my survey or go to podcastone.com and click the survey banner. I appreciate the help. Hey, let's get on with it before we get to Paul Roma. Valentine's Day is less than a week away. Are you covered? Or are you going to be in the doghouse come February the 14th? It ain't too late to be the Valentine's Day hero, and I'm going to make it real easy for you because all you got to do is order her up some flowers at books.com. That's B-O-U-Q-S dot com. This is the Valentine's Day that she ain't never going to forget because you were on your game and had the biggest, most beautiful bouquet of flowers delivered to her on Valentine's Day, not the day after. And it's a win-win for you because she's happy with her books, and you're happy because you didn't go broke buying flowers. Books flowers started just 40 bucks. So go to books.com. That's B-O-U-Q-S dot com. And use my promo code Steve to save 20% off your order. And when you register at books.com, you'll also get free weekday delivery. And with books flowers, ain't no hidden fees, no care and handling fees. They ain't going to try and upsell you on a bunch of other stuff. What you see is what you get. 
Book's flowers are grown on eco-friendly farms and cut fresh so the flowers last longer too. They have farms on the side of volcanoes and all along the coast of California. It's farm fresh flowers right to her table. So order of flowers from books.com. That's B-O-U-Q-S dot com. And use my promo code Steve to get 20% off. Get on it. Books.com and use the promo code Steve to save 20%. And remember to register so that you get the free weekday delivery. This, this is Steve Austin on Lush Leashed. I'm running a little bit late here. My guest today is Paul Roma. I haven't talked to Paul Roma in a long ass time. Paul, how are you doing? First of all, welcome to the show. Well, I'm really glad to be on your show, Steve. <sighs> I mean, you know, I feel like I feel like a fan now. I've been out of the business so long. How long have you been out of business? When did you retire? '98. I would guess about that. Yeah. God dang. And man, we just uh, wrestled a few times here and there down in WCW, and uh, shit. All this time has passed by. I'm going to read a quick email. I got a show email for the uh, Steve Austin show, and I got an email one time, and it said, uh, Hey, Steve, Paul Roma is my trainer and has told me nothing but good stories about you two from back in the day. Would you ever consider having him on as a guest? And he said, Best, Joe Zimbardi. And I said, Of course. Paul and I always got along. The respect is mutual. So anyway, that's how we hooked up this conversation. And I told Paul, shit, I mean, I got this email and I called Paul. Geez, what was it we talked? Was it November or December? I think it was December. I was sitting in a deer stand and I was talking in a real quiet voice like I was trying to kayfabe the deer so I didn't scare my <laughs> way. <laughs> I don't know what Paul was thinking. He said, this fucking Austin guy's out of his mind. <laughs> I was in a deer stand sweating my ass off trying to talk to Paul. I said, you know, we were catching up, just trading those stories because it's, it's Paul is kind of like uh, I am with a lot of guys. Man, I, we never had each other's phone number. Uh, you left the business. I went my way. Uh, we don't have each other's email address, but it's kind of one of those things where, like I said, the respect is mutual. So once we hook up, it's just like it, it, it never, you know, just like it was always uh, the way it was. You know, we just turned into friends. But you're talking to me on the phone. I'm thinking, man, this guy must think I'm real weird the way. I'm talking. Uh, and we finally, I told her, I said, to her, you got to be on my podcast. I said, we'll just sit there and shoot the breeze and talk about the old days. But give me time to get back to so I can do my research. Well, I got back to uh, Los Angeles and now they're remodeling my house. And then, uh, so I'm renting this house next door. Did you get that picture I texted you, Paul? No, I don't think I did. Oh, I, I, well, I, I told you I was. Oh, wait, that. wait, wait. That, oh, that was, wait, just now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a picture of my computer on this little bitty, it's a, it's like a $20 ottoman you get off the internet. <laughs> and, it, and Paul's laughing at me because he knows the chicken shit setup I'm talking about is a shoot. And I'm sitting in this fucking chair and I got to bend down because my microphone is so far you know, away from my mouth. So I went into the damn uh, garage and we got this little two foot step ladder. So I needed something to rest my microphone on. So I got my microphone on the two foot ladder. <laughs> I got my computer in a little box. I'm sitting in this chair. It's kind of like a lowrider chair. All I need to do is hit that lowrider music, and it'll be my theme song for the show. <laughs> is, is your life a clusterfuck like mine, Paul? Or now that you're about 58 years old, has all the years in the business made you smarter? I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I think I'm smarter, you know, and then there's those other days, man, and then I know that's just a lie I've been telling myself. God damn. I want to, I want to kind of skew this conversation more towards uh, something that, that can speak to, you know, the students uh, of the wrestling class or the wrestling program that you help coach and to be able to just talk about navigating the business, uh, learning things along the way. Because I know you've done a whole lot of interviews. I listened to some of those and I got to watch a bunch of your matches and you had a... Uh, you had speed, strength. I mean, you had a great physique, very athletic. The way you jump on those turnbuckles, uh, just moved like a cat. And you had a great look. You came in back in the in the, uh, in the time when you know shit. Would you start 85, 86? 
Yeah, maybe around there. Hell, I can't remember. But, I mean, it, it was kind of the wild, wild west back then. And back in growing up, I was in Texas, so I was really cutting my teeth on NWA, Mid-South, Power Pro, stuff like that. And then I started getting more New York right when you guys, along with Jim Powers, become the Young Stallions. And then, you know, followed you from Power and Glory and on, and then you ended up in WCW. And then we crossed paths. Hell, y'all took the world tag titles from me and Regal. You and Arn did at a television tape, and I think it was at Center Stage, wasn't it? I, I don't know if it was there or it was in Florida. Goddamn, was it Florida? It might have been. It may have been in Florida. I don't know. But anyway, let's let's go yeah. back uh, to your high school days. Because when I look at the way you worked in the ring, uh, you were aggressive as a heel. You had that mean streak. As a baby face, you had fire on your comebacks. Dude, you were really, really solid in the ring. And I'm thinking, this guy was a hell of an athlete. And I had to go back and watch some of your, your, your stuff. Dude, what's your athletic background? Were you a football player, track guy? Um, I, I ran hurdles for a little bit. Dude, um, you on a damn track running hurdles? <laughs> <laughs> Played a little football. <laughs> Dude, but you weren't as big back then. Then. Well, when I when I tried out for the pros, I was actually about 185 pounds. I was a uh, wide receiver, split end. Ran a four five forty, not bad speed, you know, for a white boy. A uh, pretty good vertical leap. Uh yeah, yeah. I could uh, at the time I could touch the top of the square in a backboard. Yeah, that's a pretty good set of goals. Hey, man, when you said you you uh, tried out, where was this at? I tried out for uh, Chicago. Made it about the third round. Um, you know, basically told me that um, one coach really loved me. This other guy just didn't want me. No way, shape, or form. So I moved on and got into wrestling. But where'd you play college at? University. I went to University of New Haven. It's kind of a... Uh, I'll make a long story short. I knew a uh, a trainer for the New York Giants. Uh, he knew about my background, uh, knew how I, he watched me play semi pro ball, and uh, he said, "Listen, you got to go to college. Just play a little organized ball, and uh, I get you a tryout tomorrow." You know, it just I know you're that good. I seen you stick people, so I was like, "Okay, great." So I worked full time, went to school full time, and. And, you know, I cashed in my insurance policies to uh, pay for school, and I couldn't do it all. So, yeah, didn't happen. So how long did you last in college? Hell, hell, maybe a year. I couldn't do it all. It was too much, you know. When you working say you couldn't full do time. it all, uh, working full-time, what, what about the books? Were you a good student? <laughs> nah, not that great. Wasn't into the books. I was into sticking people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they put in my write-up, actually. You know, I mean, they gave me a hell of a write-up and said, listen, I'd go tell him to hit that 300-pound lineman. He'd, he'd go whack him and take him out. And that's what I did. So, uh, you know, it just it wasn't meant to be. Next thing you know, I was, I was wrestling. Okay, but I know you come up in the Connecticut area, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's where you're still at. And then uh, so back in when you're trying to cut your teeth you got into uh, New Haven a little bit of college didn't like the books it was too much you're trying to work a full-time job so were you a fan of the business or did you just look at the business as hey man this is my next way that I can you know make a living no I um I I my father had asked me he said hey listen why do you he called me in the room and said, why do you do this and he had wrestling on he goes you're big enough and I said you know I said oh that crap I ain't gonna do that shit you know and he goes, oh, I should think about it. And I said, that's bullshit. And I walked away and and uh, I was a, uh, a marshal, you know, in the system, in the Connecticut system. And uh, a, a former pro fighter came up to me and, and said, hey, listen, you know, I know somebody in the wrestling business. I think you should be a wrestler. And he kind of intrigued me a little bit. So uh, I went to a local show for WWF. And um, yeah. Then I ended up joining a wrestling school, and uh, then uh, after the wrestling school, since they didn't teach you all that much, I really got my notoriety when uh, Mr. Fuji took me under his wing and started training me, and that's that's really when I got my, my break. Okay, but you're, you're training people right now. You also have a regular job. We're going to get to that. But, you know, according to the thing right here, it says uh, Tony Altamar trained you beginning uh but then right. fuji was a big influence or mentor towards you so <clears throat> what did tony altamare teach you just to stand there and look good a couple bumps there was nothing really i mean taking bumps i used my athletic ability to you know uh enhance anything and everything i did 
whether it was like when somebody straddled, running across ropes and straddled somebody, they go for a backdrop, you straddle them. You know, I started running over them like it was a hurdle. You know, I throw one leg out, one over the side, like, you know, I was running over the hurdle. And, you know, then I started doing flips off, you know, uh, backdrops, landing on my feet and um, running up the ropes, you know, walking up the ropes, things like that. And so I just enhanced everything. And then I just kept working on my drop kicking ability because I knew I could get the height. I just had to make it look pretty. It sounds like Tony Altamar was a real old school guy. Real old school. And he was just, he was creating guys for me for the WWF or, you know, the right. the big names to just chop up. So how did you come upon Mr. Fuji taking you under his wings? And how did you get into the WWF? Fuji saw me, I used to go to New Haven when they were in town. And they always tell you, bring your gear. So I bring my gear and uh, Fuji said, hey, listen, you know, uh, I need some help moving. And I said, sure, man, I'll help you. You know, just tell me when. So he told me. And I said, how about if I, you know, you got to move your entire house, right? You're going to pack it in a truck. So how about if I get some people to help? And he said, fine. Well, all in all, he, I showed up, you know, and, and we moved him out of his house. Uh, he never expected me to show up. I guess one of the ribs with the boys was, you know, tell him, yes, you're going to show up and then you leave him hanging. Right. So I showed up and uh, he thanked me and he said, hey, listen, next time we're in New Haven, get there early and I'll work with you. So I got there early and we worked for about an hour and a half, two hours, and we kept that steady going. And then he just just continued on and he started, you know, showing me different things, teaching me, you know, telling me about ring psychology and this is, you know, why you don't do that and why you do this and, you know, so on and so forth. And don't take any, you know, useless bumps and, and things like that. Yeah, and then I followed him down. Basically, when he moved to Tennessee, I was down in Tennessee working in, in uh, one of the rings down there. And anytime I was on the road or he was there, um, we traveled together. Even if I wasn't booked, we'd travel up to New Hampshire or Maine or wherever we were wrestling or that he was wrestling. And he'd get me a, a deal. He'd say, hey, listen, I don't want to wrestle tonight. Put Paul in my place. So i go in and work, and then he'd critique my match and all the way home. You know, three, four hours just talking wrestling, and um, we just hit it off, you know? I mean, I was just, I was that stand-up guy, you know, that man of my word. So were you working some independent shots? Because, you know, like you said, you know, always bring your gear with you. Yeah, that way, if you got your gear and they, they, they call you, hey, man, we need you, and so you got your gear. So were you working shots around the area or with a, um, a smaller yeah. federation? Yeah, well, they were almost like branch-offs of uh, WWE or WWF at the time, uh, Tony would get the deals, you know, get the gigs. Right. You know, Pittsfield, Mass, and, and some, you know, even uh, Brantford and all these little places, uh, you know, Watertown and Waterbury and all this. And then we go out there for, you know, $25 or whatever it was and, you know, wrestle in front of the people and, you know, try to get, get your feet wet. But again, still not knowing what the hell you were doing, you know, back at that time. So when you say that, that uh, Fuji was a mentor, I mean, dude, this wasn't just a, a, a once, hey, I'll help, you know give you a pointer here or a pointer there. You guys had a relationship and traveled together, and this guy really did work with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were, we were uh, I mean, you know, he, we called him uncle. I mean, he told me I could call him uncle, and uh, he says, you know, it meant something. And, yeah, he would just, every, every even if we watched the match, him and I together. You know, he would ask me, what do you think of this or what do you think of that? And what did he do wrong here? Or what could he have done? And, you know, so I, I just picked his brain just constantly. And, and I said, you know what, Fuj, we were in like, uh, I don't know, Illinois or something. And, and I said, you know, I just I can't get the psychology thing. He goes, listen to me, you know, in his, in his, in his language. He says, it's just going to come to you. And then you're going to be like, you know, wow, it's that easy. So I went out in the, in the match and... Uh, I was sitting in a reverse choke hold and I sat up and I said, holy shit, that's it. And the guy says to me, what? I said, that's it. He goes, that's what? And I said, that's it. That's all there is to it. That's it. And he goes, what the hell are you talking about? And we're having this conversation in the ring. And I said, man, you know, let's go home. And we walked in the locker room and Fuji was sitting there and he looked at me when I came in. He goes, you got it. And I said, I got it. He goes, I knew it. He said, I, I saw the look on your face. I said, Fooch, all this time, that's it. That's all it is, you know? And I, I try to explain that to my students. It's uh, 
it's amazing. You know, when you once you get it, it turns your whole life around on, you know, how you look at things and even life in general. So then what was it as it pertains to the squared circle that made the light go off and you say, okay, I got it. This is what it is. I just understood ring psychology. I understood how to get the people off their feet, uh, how to control the crowd, how to get them to boo. You know, I mean, I was in the Pontiac Silverdome and, you know, you get 50,000 people, 90,000 people to cheer you or boo you, you know, I mean, and, and you have them in the palm of your hand. You know, it's just, it's just I, I can't really put a finger on it, but you understand why you do what you do. You, you don't do like the Lucha Libre where they just do moves that mean absolutely nothing. They're just high spots. You know, every move, every bump means something. When I first got into the business, you know, when I was going to Chris Adams school and he didn't smarten us up, man. I mean, cause I thought something was up when I got in the business and you know, I bought in, dude. I, th I thought pro wrestling was real when I was a kid at seven or eight years old. You know, here I am right out of North Texas state. I'm in wrestling school, you know, once every Saturday after they do the TV taping at world-class championship wrestling. And this dude ain't smartening us up. So I'm thinking, man, what the, how do these guys do this shit in the ring? Anyway, a few months later, I'd have my first match and Frogman LeBlanc on live TV or live to tape, whatever it was. You know, I found out that it was a work and, and you know, how it worked. But still, I didn't really know how to go about having a match. And so that all these years later, and, and it took me, you know, give or take, I don't know if it was a year. I mean, I understood I could have a match with someone that could lead me through the paces, but I didn't really understand. And I'll never forget, and I have it somewhere in my garage. It's a uh, piece of paper, a legal paper on yellow, uh, yellow legal paper. And he wrote the formula for a match for me. And he put one, two, three, four, five, <clears throat> how many numbers there were. But basically it was baby face shine, heel heat, manic comeback, finish. And either baby goes over or the heel goes over. But you know, there was there it was right there in front of me, all the all the the little five pieces of a match and it still didn't register with me, but I did the same thing. It was like you know, maybe a year in the business or whatever. And then I think after you understand what a match is, then you can take it to the different levels of complexity that you're able to take it to. But I was watching, uh, uh, you know, basketball uh, a while back and I was watching the Super Bowl this past weekend. And sometimes, you know, like to your students that are in your, uh, your class, you know, sometimes you can think of a match like this, you know, when it's that baby face shine or if the heel starts over on top, you know, sometimes it's a thing where, you know, if you're watching a basketball game, and there's that momentum swing and all of a sudden yep. the, the, the team will get on like a 12, 15, 16, 20 point run and you're thinking what the fuck's going on here? The other guy's going to get are they going to start making shots? Well all of a sudden the momentum turns and so they start making everything and the other team starts kind of blowing their lead and so yep. if you just think of it as an athletic contest you know you're, you're, you're simulating a, not a real fight but you're, you're, you're well you are you're, but it's a wrestling match so you're simulating you're simulating combat so you just got to put it in the context of that but people get caught up sometimes i think too much in trying to think of what the high spot should be but just think of the logics of what you said connecting to the people and, and make them come with you and being able to control and manipulate them by what you do in the ring and and not begging them but working them to get them where you want them right would you, would you and, agree with that and, yeah yeah and, and i learned that in toronto i was i was working with uh Arn and uh, Tali, and and you know he got me in a hold, and, and Toronto was tough. They wanted you to move all the time, and they started booing. And I said to Tully, I said, "Come on, let's go." You know they're booing, and he goes, "Now relax, kid." And I said, "No, no, they're booing, man. We got to do a spot. They're booing." He goes, "Just relax. They'll come." You know, and and I relaxed, and he goes, "Okay, now we go," and and they erupted. So I mean, I had I had good people around me. I had good people teaching me. You know, since I was connected with Fuji, I had Harley Race, you know, another person that helped me, uh, Les Thornton. You know, I had some really good people around me that, you know, really had a lot of input, which is what I liked. Yeah. So uh, I owe it all to him. I got to ask you a question about Harley. I got to ask you a question about Harley. But before I get to Harley, Mr. Fuji was the king of ribs, from what I understand. <laughs> You're riding with the guy, so I'm sure he's not ribbing you. You're kind of his protege. He's taking you under his wing. He's the the wily veteran, and you, here you are, this this kid, this young man in the business. So he's taking you under his wing. Did he discuss ribs with you? 
Yes, and 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 here's the thing: <laughs> we're we're on a flight. We're going to Australia, and he says to me, one of the one of the funniest ribs. I think it was funny. Uh, they would paint the boys' fingernails when they went to sleep when we were flying overseas, you know, with nail polish. Yeah. So he calls me up to first class, and he, he says to me, here. And he hands me the nail polish. He goes, go paint Don Morocco's nails. Oh, no. And, and I went, Fuji, please. <laughs> I'll do anything, but not Don. Please not Don. <laughs> and he goes, oi, boy son, you want to graduate? And I said, yes, Fuji, yes, Uncle, I want to graduate. He goes, then you do Uncle Say. You know, because that's how he spoke. And I was like, okay. So I went over, and Morocco was sleeping, and I was trembling, man. I was trembling, <laughs> painting this guy's nails. So we're in the back of the plane, and and Morocco's standing there next to me. You know, and he's a big beast of a man. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm like, hey, Don, what's going on? He goes, ah, some prick painted my nails. And I went, yeah, some bitch got me too. You know, <laughs> he was like, he did? I said, yeah. So I was just trying to get the heat off me. I was like, shit, man. But yeah, yeah, no, he, uh, biggest river. I mean, Fuji was the biggest river. Actually, Vince went to Fuji one day and, and said, please, you know, I need you to, you know, just calm down, slow down on the ribs. So what'd he do? He, he actually did. He actually slowed down on them a little bit. I mean, they're out of control. I mean, what they did to uh, uh, the rooster, Terry Taylor. What did they do? Well, he came in, you know, and there was this thing, man, about WWF and nobody from, you know, either NWA or down south should right. come into our company and vice versa. So Terry Taylor comes in and he had his Halliburton. He came in in a suit. Um, when he went into the ring, they busted open his Halliburton. They cut the, uh, made the, the long pants shorts on his suit. I mean, they just, and he came in, put him, you know, put it, he, he had his ring stuff on and he put his stuff away and, and just walked out like that. I mean, because, you know, if you put the guys over, they're going to just yeah, you know something. continue on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was brutal, man. And then Outback Jack, they got him. I mean, they they got Fuji got him. He made the worst mistake he could ever make. He walked down to Fuji at the bar and and said, "Hey, mate." He goes, uh, "I bet I can out drink you." And Fuji looked at him and you don't say that to you know a veteran like him. So they got him all messed up. They took the crocodile off his back. <laughs> they uh, jumped on his Halliburton and crushed that thing. And they pissed all over all of his clothes. <laughs> I actually went in the room because uh, I thought he was dead. I really did. He was just sitting in the chair, hunched over. I, yeah. I just wanted to make sure he was breathing. Then I left him there and walked out. Were you, were you ever a big river yourself? Uh, because I wasn't. I, and I think you're probably like me. I, I, a little bit of a, I was a little bit of a loner. I had, I had the guys that I hung around with, but I wasn't into being ribbed. I could, I could appreciate a good rib if I saw one or that was lighthearted. But the serious ribs, you know, I, I wasn't really a big fan of. But were you ever no. a river? Did anybody rib you? Because you, you, you pretty much had a, a, a reputation for being a guy that, hey man, you're, you're a man of your word, but you're a guy that doesn't like to be fucked with. Yeah, yeah, no, um, like, you know, again, I was protected. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, Fuji was the godfather of wrestling. And, you know, the first time he introduced me to Andre, you know, I walked in and, and he goes, come here. He goes, Andre, this is Paul. He's with me. This is this is my boy. And Andre said, oh, okay. He goes, hey, you play cards? And I said, no. He goes, okay, sit down. We'll play for money. I'll teach you. And then Andre and I hit it off. And, and then Ted Arcidi walks in to the locker room and he goes, get out of here. And Arcidi looks at, at Andre and he's like, what? He goes, I said, get out of here. He goes, well, I have to change. He goes, you go find another place to change. Get out of here now. So he left. So, I mean, if you, know, you didn't have a little juice. And I, I think that's what helped, too, because, um, you know, nobody wanted to mess with Fuji. I went into Cleveland and... Uh, I walk in the locker room, right? I'm all happy. I go to work. And all of a sudden, one of the guys grabbed me and said, hey, Fuji wants you. You better get upstairs right now. He's pissed. So I was like, he's pissed? Like, yeah, man, he's upstairs. You better go. So I go running upstairs. And I'm like, what the hell did I do, right? 
So I walk up to him and he goes, I said, Fuj, what's up? He goes, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean, what did I do? I just got here. He goes, what did you do? What did you say about Harley? And I said, I didn't say anything about Harley. I said, I love Harley. He goes, well, you better go talk to Harley. So I was like, holy shit, man. So I go back downstairs and there's Harley, you know? I mean, that, that was one tough dude right there, uh, Harley. Yes. You know, he had he had grips on him. I mean, damn, man. He could he could turn the, the lug nuts off a, off a, a, a car, a tire. I mean, he was unbelievable. So I, he's sitting there, and I said, Harley, you got a minute? He looks up at me, like, you know, kind of mean and pissed. So he, he goes, yeah, come here. So we walk into the men's room, and uh, I said, Fuji just told me that you're pissed at me. I don't know what I did, you know? I said, listen, I said, I would never say anything about you, you know? I said, I have nothing but love for you. And uh, he goes, well, somebody said that you said something about me. And I said, I'll tell you what, Harley, you bring that son of a bitch in here and I'll punch him right in his fucking face. And he goes, you know what? He gave me a big hug. He goes, that's all I needed to hear. He goes, I'll take care of it. And that was it. Walked out of there and yeah. So, got, you know, the boys trying to, trying to bury me. But again, you know, because I had a relationship with Fuji and, and Harley and, you know, and I told him, I had said to Harley too, I said, you know, you, you do nothing but help me. We get in the ring, you teach me things. I said, I, I have nothing but, but love for you, man. I would never say anything against you. All right, before we continue on, Paul, we got to take a minute here to thank one of the sponsors who's not only keep this show free for you to download, but who's also keeping my wife happy. Blue Apron. Y'all know that I don't cook and that my wife is a gourmet cook who loves to be in the kitchen, but hey, She's got a lot going on herself and can't make me gourmet dinners every single night. And I'm sure a lot of y'all are in the same boat. That's why you should check out Blue Apron. Blue Apron makes home cooking easy for everyone. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. And every meal with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and can be made in 40 minutes or less. This is idiot-proof cooking, people. You can choose your meals each week and your delivery options. There's no weekly commitment, so you can get deliveries when you want them. Blue Apron uses only fresh, high-quality ingredients in all their recipes. And some of this month's options include cashew chicken stir-fry with tango mandarins and jasmine rice. Mm -mm. And roasted pork with apple, walnut, and farro salad. Plus, they got vegetarian options like udon noodle soup with miso and soft-boiled eggs, which makes my wife happy. You can see this week's full menu options and get your first three meals free with free shipping at blueapron.com slash unleashed. You'll love how good the food tastes and how easy it is to make home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So get on it. Go to blueapron.com slash unleashed. That's blueapron.com slash unleashed. All right, if you're in the market for a car, then you need to check out TrueCar.com and the TrueCar app. TrueCar gives you the pricing information you need to feel confident about your purchase. When you register a TrueCar, you'll see what other people in your local market pay for the car you want. From there, you can connect with a local TrueCar certified dealer and enjoy a more confident car buying experience. TrueCar shows you real pricing on actual inventory, so you see competitive pricing offered to you by TrueCar certified dealers for vehicles that are actually on their lots. TrueCar makes car buying easy, no matter if you're looking for a brand new or a used vehicle. And there's over 500,000 pre-owned vehicles available from TrueCar certified dealers nationwide, and there are over 13,000 TrueCar certified dealers. And over 2 million cars have been sold to TrueCar users by the TrueCar certified dealer network. True Car users save an average of over $3,000 off MSRP. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit TrueCar.com or download the True Car app to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleash. Unleash. Let me ask you a question about Fuji. I, yeah, I understand. You know, I saw him on the WWF. I know he's in the Hall of Fame, highly respected. But what gave him such clout in that locker room? What the fuck was it? Because he was just a little guy. Well, my under 
<laughs> I can tell you a story that I heard. Uh, people swear it's true. Uh, Fuji told me the story. I have to believe it's true. My understanding was he was uh, a hitman on his island. He was basically a real badass dude. I know that he uh, had neighbors complain about his dog barking every night, every night, and they, you know, call the cops and, and so on. So Fuji invited him over for a uh, little picnic, and he took their dog, and he fed him their own dog. <laughs> he cooked their own dog and fed it to him. <laughs> God damn, I think I might have heard that story from somewhere. Is that a shoot? Yeah, that's a shoot, man. That is a shoot. But all the boys loved him. But if, but he was a, a merciless river. I mean, he, he I, I think it was all. I, I think it was done in jest. I think it was just. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it was just just a total prank. There was no malice behind it. But you know, some of the ribs can get pretty wicked. Uh, Harley race. You just told me the conversation you had in the bathroom with him. Uh, we used to go over to Harley's house when we was working with WCW. And we'd all go over there, and uh, him and his wife at the time, he would barbecue, and his wife would make all these desserts, and Harley was an excellent cook. And, man, there was 10 or 12 of us over there, and we'd be laying around. This is before the matches, and then you know, it was like no, no one wanted to leave. We'd already been on the road. We'd go to Harley's for uh, lunch. No one wants to leave because they don't want to be rude. And so everybody's just laying around. And so finally Harley would come in there, and you know how Harley talked because you knew him well. Yeah. All right, because right, Harley never raised his voice. So he would walk <laughs> into the living room. Okay, everybody get out. And that meant it was time to go. We'd go back to our hotel room, catch a shower, and then we'd go to the building. we work Kansas City. And then we'd go back to Harley's that night and just drink beer all night and, and shoot pool. But Harley was one of the toughest guys in the history of the business. And Ric Flair always told me that. And sometimes when he would go to Japan to defend the NWA title, but I don't know if he had heat or that he needed protection or whatever, they would send Harley to watch Flair's back. So I had heard that he was a tough man. What what made him so tough? Because Harley was a guy that took me under his wing as well. I was supposed to be the United States uh, heavyweight champion down there in uh, WCW, but they put me and Brian together, and we become the Hollywood Blondes. I always heard the story. Let me put the uh, nail in the coffin. I heard so many stories, but did you ever see any instances of Harley having to, you know, be a tough guy or handle anybody? Where did the reputation come from? I don't know. I, I never, I never saw him put his hands on anybody. But everybody feared him. I mean, everybody <laughs> liked him. Everybody respected yeah, I, I, him. But everybody I, feared I, well, the shit out of him. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I had said this. To, you know, even my students, I said to, I said, listen, either you're feared or you're respected, but either one is okay, because chances are no one's going to, well, no one's going to fuck with you if you have either one of those, you know, that's and that's an interesting, good. that's an interesting standpoint. And, and with Harley, you know, I respected him. Same here. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't a question of, you know, hey, here I am, this, you know, young dude, 245, I can kick box, you know, I could box, man, I could take punches. It wasn't about that. It was, you know, the way I was brought up, I respected him. Um, you know, I mean, he put those clamps on my traps a few times and, you know, brought the sweat out of me and made me tremble. But, um, you know, he's such a great guy. You know, he just he just is. Um, I, I just think he something happened and it carried on. The reputation carried on. You don't like Fuji. The reputation carried on. What, did, what, what was the deal with his grip strength when you say he had the clamps? He would he would catch me from behind sitting down and he would stick his fingers in my traps right, right. yeah and and i would just let this sound out like this <laughs> you know like that because i couldn't talk yeah. you know and he and, and i said harley man come on you know he goes he so he told me one day he goes i get such a kick out of that that's why he just every time he saw me you know my back to him he comes sneaking up on me and, and he'd do it and he just laughed man you just saw this big Mountain of a man chuckling with his shoulders, you know, just going up and down. He just got the biggest kick out of it. And Harley had the best uh, stories in the world, and he would start telling a story and he'd do that low gravel voice. One time <laughs> we were down there in WCW, and you've been around the business long enough because you, you, you know, you try to take a flat back bump, you try to protect yourself, but inevitably you're going to land Caddy Wampus, you're going to fuck some shit up, your, your lower back's going to go out your neck or something. Yep. So, anyway, my neck was all jacked up. We were on the road somewhere, it might have been in Kansas City. He goes, Kid, come here. 
Because, you know, a lot of the boys, you kind of turn into self-made chiropractors. You know, some of the guys are pretty good at cracking necks, working on the back and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Because that, that was the way it was back then. As you know, dude, we didn't have, and, and you were a generation, half generation before me, we didn't have any medical staff. We didn't have doctors, you know, trainers and stuff like that. This was still a stone ages so for the most part. So anyway, hardly knew I had a bad neck or my neck was jammed up. So he tells me to lay down and I'm hanging my neck, my neck off my head off the end of the table and the table is you know one that you would sit on to get taped up like at a football facility yeah and he rolled up a towel and he wrapped it around my neck and then he that was what he's going to use for traction and he jerked the shit out of the towel like he's going to pull my head off to decompress it and i swear to god paul when he did that it felt like lightning bolts shot out of my fingers and my toes i thought he was going to paralyze me and i'm thinking god <laughs> damn it scared the fuck out of me <laughs> And he goes, okay, now get up. <laughs> so I think, I, now my you neck is taller, right? Dude, now I'm about six five. Yeah. So now I'm thinking, okay. I said, no, I'm good, Harley. I think my neck feels better. Meanwhile, it hurts like a motherfucker. He goes, oh, come here. <laughs> he goes, come here. So he puts me in a full Nelson. He picks me up and just jerks the fuck out of me. You know when the full Nelson, you know what it feels like. He pushes my <laughs> neck down. And then again, I felt like lightning bolt shot on my, my fingers and my feet. And he goes, he turned around. He looks at me, he goes, how's that feel, kid? <laughs> so what, what are you going to tell Harley Race? First of all, <laughs> you damn near paralyzed me. But I said, I fucking feel like brand new, Harley. <laughs> he goes, just let me, just let me, let me know. You, he said, let me know if you need me to do that again. <laughs> said, hey, you ain't got to worry about that shit. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. No, he, he worked on me in the ring one day. I told him, you know, my neck was sore. And he, he got me in a hold and he started massaging my neck. And the same thing, just like you got him down pat, you know, how's that kid? You know, I mean, I'm like, oh, that feels great. Thank you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, hey, when good you, stuff. When you get when you first came into the WWF and you had to work your way up the card. But when you first came in there, uh, what was what was the case as far as negotiating for money? Because this before that, you know, maybe this before you and Jim Powers, you, you would become a tag team. And then right. the young staff his name was was born but just as far as pay right off jump street how did they negotiate that just say hey kid you come in here you because know, i saw a match you was working with terry funk competitive match but you were there to do the favor so what would they tell you back then and in, in the wild west days just as far as pay structure well when we were they structured it as when you did tv tapings they gave you 50 dollars because they felt that you they were giving you exposure that you know, paid you way more than you could ever get. And that's an interesting uh, standpoint for validating a low pay. Correct. But, um, and, and in theory, it is correct. They're giving you television, they are giving right. you television exposure to go do other things, but you know, you're there to work and you, you got a mouth to feed or a couple of mouths. Right, exactly. You know, then it was just when, when I got my, my chance, it actually happened, uh, I was at TV in Poughkeepsie, New York, and I walked over to Fuji, you know, after after doing a job, and and I said I'm done. And he goes, okay, you know, are you going home? And I said, no, Fuji, I'm done. And he goes, I don't understand. I said, I'm done. I said, I had enough of this. I said, I look better than these guys. I could, I have, I could work. I said, I got a great, my body's better than all of theirs. You know, I was that cocky dude. I didn't give a shit. Right. You know. And uh, he goes, oh, wait, wait, wait. And I said, no, I had enough. I said, I'm, I'm making these guys look great. You know, they look like shit and I make them look great because they're beating me. I said, so, you know what? I had enough. It's just, it's not going to happen. You know, they don't want to do anything with me. I'm good with it, you know? And he goes, wait, wait, wait. He says, you know, let me, let me talk to Caesar, meaning Vince. And uh, he goes, you know, just, just go home. You know, just, just don't think like that. You know, let me talk to him. So then, uh, he talked to Caesar and they gave me some bookings, you know, and you pick up, you know, two, three hundred dollars a night. You know, one one week I did three shows. So, I, you know, I got like nine hundred bucks. And, you know, you figure back in 85. That's for a damn week, good money. That's damn good money. Exactly. And I said, shit, I could get used to this, you know. Um, and then I just started, you know, getting more and more. At that point, you know, if you're going to get beat, 
really don't get it doesn't hurt as much because you're, you're at least lining your pockets a little bit so did you ever uh sign a contract that said you would work x number of dates how did it work back then because when they put uh well you, you and jim powers were together the young stallions they they come up with the name whether it was on tv vince doing commentary whatever y'all the young stallions and right. they, they were they, they'd push you guys a little bit then not so much or whatever the run was you've talked about a, a million times my question is did you did, did they ever back in those days sign the boys to contracts to say okay you're here for a year or no, they, I, I they know there was no me. guaranteed money yeah no there's no guaranteed money they signed me they had me sign a contract you know that just basically said they could obviously they own my likeness you know and all that stuff um i i had a big push they sent me to australia um sd jones and i were and, and if you would believe this sd jones and i were probably more popular than hogan was here we were just he says he said to me one day he goes you don't really understand what's going on and i said what are you talking about and he goes i don't think you understand how how big we are how over we are and uh yeah he took me out and yeah i found out right quick how over we were we were just we were on everything we were on commercial toyota commercials and hilux commercials and I was on the dating game and and uh, I mean everywhere we we you know hosted went to nightclubs and they paid us to spin records you know and I mean we had carte blanche in Australia and he was right and you know then you come back to reality which is here and, <laughs> and you, you know you're, you're back to the grind but we Jimmy and I got our break as young stallions because uh, Zinc and Martel had broken up ah so they so, they needed another good looking tag team, right? So they said, "Listen, we're going to announce Zink and Martel aren't going to be here, and we're going to announce that you're going to be running out, going after the titles. And as soon as we announce that, we're going to hit your music. You hit the ring because we don't want the people all pissed off. So that's what we did. Well, Jimmy thought that the Young Stallions. He came up to me, goes, "They want to call us the Young Stallions," and I said, "Okay." And he goes, "Well, I'm not Italian." I said, well, they're not, we're not the Italian Stallions, they we're the Young Stallions. <laughs> he goes, well, it's a rib. And I said, okay. He goes, well, is this bullshit? It's a rib. And I said, listen, if we get booked and we book steady, I don't give a shit if it's a rib. You know, I got a family to take care of. So we went out as the Young Stallions. They gave us a nice little push. I went from, I was making more money before I hooked up with Jimmy um you know doing singles and then once we started getting the pay-per-views then obviously i was making a lot more money you know what i mean right because you get more for those there was no dollar amount set it, it all fluctuated so it all depends on the house and they put me on great houses i i can't complain you know so i was making i was making you know good buck so i can't bitch about it um and then jimmy kept coming to the ring drunk and one of the guys grabbed me one night and he said, listen, I don't want to work with him anymore. He's drunk and I'm putting my, my body at risk. And so I started doing double time. So I was, you know, doing everything until the comeback. He made the comeback. And then I finally said, I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm wearing my body out. And I told him, you know, he's got to cut the shit. And, you know, he got kind of like a little mouthy, like, you know, you think you're a big deal. And I'm like, dude, I don't think I'm a big deal, but I'm doing all the work. We have a 20 minute match. I'm in there for 19 minutes. Are you kidding me? I said, so you know what? I'm done. I, so I grabbed Pat. We were at a TV in like Arizona or something. And I grabbed Pat and I said, I can't do this anymore with him. I said, he's coming to the ring drunk. I said, I have a wife, kids, a house. I said, he lives in an apartment. If he loses his job, he doesn't care. You know, that's all he has to pay for. I said, but I lose everything. I worked too hard to get here. So Pat begged me because Pat was the one who came up with the Young Stallions. So he got really, I had a lot of heat with Pat, a lot of heat. And I, I really didn't know it. I didn't realize Pat was the one who came up with it. So Pat said, you know, please reconsider. And I said, no, Pat. I said, I don't want to do this anymore with him. So we he disbanded us and people came up to me like uh, demolition. And said, oh, I heard that, uh, you know, you don't want to work with Jimmy. And basically it was all my fault. And I was like, well, you know, we'll see the cream will come to the top. You believe what you want to believe. And that was uh, Bill Eady that said that to me. So uh, 
yeah, they gave me a little bit of a push. I started making some money and then back on the back burner. Ray was on the back burner. So I just came together one day and, and I went to the office, sat down with Pat and power and glory was formed. Hey, let's go back to the Jim Powers thing because I've heard you yeah. talk about the stories about him coming to the ring, a little bit intoxicated, drunk, whatever. So when you told Pat about this, you know, why didn't they call Jim aside and say, hey, man, listen, do you have some issues or are you drinking before you get here or Paul's doing all the work or your opponents, the people you're working with, don't feel safe with you? Did they address anything with Jim rather than just fade the heat to you like it was your fault? Because yeah, that should, no, should have been addressed. Yeah, it wasn't, though. You, you know how it was. I mean, you were there for, for a while. I, it may have changed when you got there. I don't know. But, you know, I, I told Pat. I told him right in front of Jimmy. Hell, Jimmy didn't even deny it. I said, the guys don't want to work with them. You know, he's coming to the ring. He stinks of alcohol. And uh, I said, I can't do this anymore, you know. And, you know, Pat just looked at me and said, well, I, I, just, you know, reconsider. You know, just reconsider. And instead of turning to Jimmy and saying, listen, you know, what the fuck are you doing, man? I put this team together. I want this to work. Nothing. It was all on me. So what so happened to that guy? Up. I appreciate the fact that you had the balls to stand up and say, hey, man, you know, fuck, first of all, you're doing the three quarters of the work, if not more. Other guys don't feel safe. But then, you know, just because you you want to be a stand-up guy and don't want to work with a guy who's intoxicated, you say something. That takes a lot of balls. Whatever happened to Jim Powers, uh, because I know you would go on to form Power and Glory with Ray, and we'll talk about that, but what did they do with Jim? And was he not in the space of, oh, was he in, he might have been in pro wrestler mode where, hey man, it's it's a 24-7 party and he got caught up in the grind because it doesn't sound like the business was a priority to him. I don't want to put mouth, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but you were there what was his take on things from your perspective it, it was it was a it was a big game to him you know like he had notoriety people noticed him you know kind of got caught up in the moment the head swelled up and yeah you know he's bigger than the game and what what was funny was i had i had gone to a show late but i called the office and i said hey listen i'm going to be late to the show I just want you to know they said no problem paul we'll let the agent know so i go running to the ring jimmy already hit the ring and i come running in after him and i come in he's like oh nice of you to show up and i'm like dude they are they knew i called the office they knew i was going to be late and then you know he started giving me shit in the ring and i said you know what this has got to stop or i'm going to crack this kid so i said you know i'll just let it go and i i let it go and then he started hanging out with the British Bulldogs. He started coming to shows late, you know, thinking, I said, dude, you're not a British Bulldog. They could get away with this. We're the young stallions, man. We can't get away with this stuff. You can't be running, you know, muck with these guys. They get in trouble. They're not getting fired. They're the damn British Bulldogs, you know? And, uh, yeah, he just didn't get it. I don't know. He just didn't get it. How long did he last in the business after that? Because when he left there, I never heard from him again, unless I yeah. missed something. No, I, I, um, he, they gave me a, a push as a single, and you know he was just kind of basically on the back burner, spots here and there, and then when I got with you know Ray, that was it really. It, it was over after that. I didn't hear or see you know see him for. Probably just at TVs. When I was watching some of your work, um, and and the, and the young stallions, mm, you you were really mechanically sound. But I, th I I thought you would get even more mechanically sound. And it seemed to me you were really uh, in a comfort zone, in a heel role rather than a babyface role. Am I correct? Oh, you hit it a hundred percent. For me, that's the way I like to work too. Uh, so why so for you? I, I guess because. I've always been confident in my, my ability, confident in everything that I've done, you know, and I try to teach that to my, my daughter, you know, who's in gymnastics. There's no second place. If so, if you come in second, that means somebody worked harder than you, you know, and that means you got to work hard. So it came easy for me because I was that, you know, I bodybuild. Every show I go in, for the most part, I'd win. I'd walk on stage and just look at the trophies, with, you know, with one of my buddies, and be like, "I'll take that one, that one, and that one." Oh, okay, you know, and that's what I would do. So I was always—I should say—always used to, but I was very confident. 
So, you know, turning heel made it so easy. Um, one of the agents, uh, Blackjack or uh, um, uh, Jack Lanza, yes. I think it was. Yeah. Jack Lanza said to me, when I turned heel, he said to me, uh, he watched my match. He goes, yeah, you know, you shouldn't do that. You know, you should do this and this and this. And I'm like, okay. So then the next night I went out there and I did what he told me to do. And I was very uncomfortable. And then, you know, Kurt Henning grabbed me. And he goes, what are you doing? And I said, well, Jack told me to do these things. And he goes, listen, don't get mad, okay? I'm going to just tell you what to do. I said, no, please. I mean, you tell me, please. He goes, just be yourself. He goes, you know what I mean? Just be, he goes, just be an asshole. He goes, be that guy that walks in the locker room that people hate. And I said, done. And the next night I was on the show and he was on the show and I just let it loose. And I walked out and and perfect stand there. He goes, how'd it feel? I said, it was fucking great. He goes, yes, it was. That's you. That's what you need to be. Be yourself. Don't listen to these other assholes. Man, just be yourself. Man, that's a, that's just great advice because I, I've told a lot of people that, and, and that was a, a big key to my success, I think, early on in my career, uh, as, as did many maybe uh, people try to emulate someone who was uh, an influence on them. And I thought I would try to work like Ric Flair, you know, kind of a, a cowardly heel. Obviously, he was vicious during his heat, but he was a cowardly heel and, you know, a premier wrestler, you know, one of the best of all time. You know, it didn't really work for me when I got dropped on my head when I turned into Stone Cold Steve Austin, when I basically just turned up the volume of who and what I was as a competitive person in an athletic endeavor, that's when everything lined up for me. I was a mechanic down when we worked together in WCW, and Stunning Steve didn't really have a bio or a it wasn't a character, it was just a name that Dr. Tom Pritchard had given me, but I, you know, Stone Cold was me turned up to 11 or 12. And speaking about Kurt Henning, when I first walked in those doors, I've told this story before, everybody's heard me tell it, but you know, Kurt knew me from WCW, and he picked me up, he goes, hey man, come here, I want to introduce you to somebody. And he took me into the production truck and introduced me to Kevin Dunn. He goes, this guy can help you out a whole lot. And he was right, Kevin Dunn did help me out a whole lot but here he goes again because Kurt Henning was one of the most generous guys I ever knew in the business he didn't have any reason and when I came in in theory I'm in competition for a spot that he's got down the road he was way better than me at the time or maybe right. for, forever was but here was a guy he didn't I had no business helping you if he didn't want to but that's right. the kind of giving guy that he was and that was some of the best advice I think I'm sure you got a lot of good advice but that was some of the best advice you'd ever given and it came unsolicited from all, one of the all-time greats yeah yeah and, and, uh, and uh, to this day matter of fact Paul Orndorff I saw him last year in New York and uh, and you know went over and we you know we hugged and kissed each other and I said to him again I said you know I'm going to bring it up to you again I remember the day you told me, you called me over, you said, hey, kid, listen to me. You look great. You got a great physique. You could wrestle. Vince will never do anything with you. He said, so what you have to do is promote yourself. So whatever Paul Roma does every night in that ring, no matter how tired you are or how hurt you are, you give those people Paul Roma, what they're supposed to see. And he looked at me and he goes, all these years, you still remember that? I said, I'll never forget that. The best advice you ever gave me. And let me tell you, those days when I was hurting and I still got out and I had to give him what, you know, I had Paul Orndorff in the back of my head tell me that. And that was a baby face. I did it. I hurt even more when, you know, the next night, but I did it. And tell me about the conversation with Paul Orndorff because I can tell you exactly how it went down. He was about 10 or 12 inches from your face. He was staring you directly in the eyes. He was talking in a low voice, and he was very intense. He wasn't intense. yelling. He wasn't angry. But it went, when Paul is passionate about something, and he's trying to give you a message or wants to, to give you some valuable information, that's how he does it. Am I correct? Oh, you hit it spot on. <laughs> he is intense. <laughs> I mean, you, you look like almost to a point where you th you know you think he's he wants to peel the skin off your face. But it's just, 
it's a passion. You know, you could see the difference. And you feel it. it. You feel it. And yeah. he's telling you, and what he's saying was right. And I'll never forget, uh, this was before you guys were pretty wonderful in WCW. And I was actually traveling with Paul because he's the one that got me back into deer hunting. When I'd come in from Texas, I'd stopped hunting because I was in a wrestling business now and didn't have anybody that hunted. Me and Paul Orndor started riding down the road together. We were both working heel. And we'd be driving down the road, and he'd see a deer out in the field, and man, he'd almost crazy, he'd go crazy when he saw the deer. Look at that deer! Look at that deer! And I'm like, Jesus Christ, it's a fucking deer! He goes, You hunt? I said, No, man, I, I kind of stopped hunting because I started wrestling. Oh, you got to start hunting again. Oh, well, I don't know where to go. We well, can come with me. I got a lease down to South Georgia. So anyway, I got on a lease South Georgia, built a seven mag. Rick Rude came out there, and we started hunting together. But anyway, here's the story. Me and Paul were riding down the road, and he had worked a singles match with you that night. And y'all probably went about 12, 15 minutes. And I told you this story a couple of months ago when I was sitting at a deer stand. And during that match, you know, uh, he did something to you. And uh, we got a shower. We're riding down the road. And I looked over at Paul, and he's driving. And I said, man, there's one part of that about that match you had with Paul that I really liked. And he goes, hang on, let me think about it. And I'll tell you what it is. He thought for just about two or three minutes. He looked at me while he was driving with the steering wheel. He goes, it was the arm bar spot. And I'm thinking, how in the fuck did he know that? In theory, <laughs> an arm bar spot may be one of the most boring because he just had he had an arm bar applied on you. He had it hooked deep. You were sitting on your ass. Your feet were in front of you. And he had his legs kind of, you know, in that wide stance. And he had that deep arm bar. And he had his chest out. And he was looking up. And I said, how in the fuck did you know that? And he goes, that's power. And it, that's, that's all he said. He goes, that's power, brother. He goes, I had him right there, and I was showing those people I had power. And I said, Jesus Christ. I said, you're right. I said, that was my favorite part of the match. <laughs> Is that unbelievable or what? He, yeah. I mean, because you were gonna, you, he was going to flip-flop and fly for you. You were going to make that dynamic athletic comeback that you would make. But that was my favorite part of the match, and he knew it. And I guess he knew what was going through my head. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you were you were at that level, and that's what a lot of people are not. Like even today, they're not at that level. You know, they they think you know that you you have to set yourself on fire and throw yourself off the top of a steel cage, you know, to get an applause from the people. Get, and that's their high spot. It just doesn't work. You, know, it's like Bugs Bunny, right? And Donald Duck, or whatever his name is, Daffy Duck, when he blows himself up on stage and the people finally applaud for him. Right. And he's like, well, like, encore, encore. I could only do this once. That's what it's like today in wrestling. They can only do it once. All right, Paul, to give me the go-home cue, let's put a hold on it right here and come back next week and pick it up with power and glory. But right now, it's time for my video of the week. And I was thinking about doing a Young Stallions match from the old days, but, man, i tell you what. I come across on WWE Network a hot match with Power and Glory versus The Rockers, SummerSlam 1990, August 27, 1990. And I think the setup here is, it looks like Shawn Michaels has got an injury to his knee or some type of injury in general. Uh, the Rockers go to the ring. Uh, Hercules and Paul Roma uh, jumble them at ringside, get the heat on Sean, and it's basically a handicap match from then on, and it's action-packed, good stuff. Uh, Paul, great work in the ring, uh, high energy, smooth, and I always liked the work of Ray Hernandez, Hercules, just a big, powerful physique, thought he looked like a million bucks, good, uh, just straight overhand right, was a great working punch, and i tell you what, I just think these guys were a hell of a tag team. It's action-packed from start to finish, Sean Sean keeps trying to get back into the ring. Power and glory keep knocking his ass back down. At the end of the day, it's Paul Roma getting the win with his partner, Hercules. Power and glory over to Rockers, SummerSlam 1990. Check that out. And then next week, maybe we'll go into some Young Stallions days. But you can see a difference here because the difference in Paul's work with uh, Ray is power and glory. He's way more confident. He's much more aggressive. He was in his comfort zone because he's working heel. Uh, Young Stallions were a fine babyface tag team, but Paul, uh, you know, as we talked about, was always more comfortable working heel as I was. So anyway, it's a heck of a uh, handicap match 
great heat, hot crowd, good event, and that's my match of the day. Check it out. Hey, man, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Steve Austin is about to have a bunch of new t-shirts that we haven't released yet. All the ones I used to film the latest season of Broken Skull Challenge. Go to ProWrestlingTees.com slash Steve Austin or BrokenSkullRanch.com. Man, I tell you what, I'm so damn tired, I need a Broken Skull IPA. And I can get one from El Segundo Brewing Company. If you can't get there yourself, you can get it at Whole Foods and Total Wines if you live in California. And if you don't, check inside the seller.com to see if they ship to your state. Man, I appreciate y'all supporting the sponsors of the Steve Austin Podcast because they're the ones that let me do this for you free twice a week. So big thanks to the Books. Order flowers from Books.com. Use the promo code Steve to save 20% off your order. To Blue Apron, go to blueapron.com slash unleashed to get your first three meals free with free shipping. And of course, Amazon, they've been supporting this podcast since episode number one. And Amazon is the best place to get the cold steel broken skull knife, just 75 bucks for the most badass pocket knife on the planet. And if you order the broken skull cold steel knife through my Amazon links, Amazon will kick back a couple of bucks to the podcast, not costing you anything at all. They just help us pay our production fees, and you can buy anything you want and help out the podcast in the process. You can find my Amazon links by going to podcastone.com, clicking on the Killer Deals button in the top right corner of the page, and then hitting the Steve Austin Show button, because I got Amazon links for the USA, UK, and Canada. So hit up podcastone.com, click the Killer Deals button in the top right corner, then click on the Steve Austin Show. If you bookmark it, anytime you want something, you can find it one click. Hey, keep listening because the 60-second AP News headlines are coming up next. Until next time, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. Download new episodes of Steve Austin Unleashed every Thursday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. The Forbes interview from Podcast One just launched with the king of podcasting, Adam Carolla. On February 1st, we're dropping a new show. It's called Forbes Under 30, where we talk to young entrepreneurs, hosted by me, Steve Goldblum. It's interesting because when you're a creator, that never leaves you. You always have this urge to want to create. Like, it's just who you are. You like, you like to grow from... Rick and Ralph, she knew she was the driver the whole time. That's Martellus Bennett, one of our first guests. Who knew this NFL star was also an artist? He's that and much more. Subscribe to Under 30 on iTunes now and be sure to give us a rating and a review. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One right after this. AP Update, I'm Ed Donahue. Jeff Sessions was sworn in today at the White House as the next Attorney General. He's a man of integrity, a man of principle, and a man of total, utter resolve. You just got a little witnessing of that. President Trump says Sessions is the right man to lead a crackdown on violent crime and terrorism. Sessions says a spike in violence is not a blip. We will deploy the talents and abilities of the Department of Justice in the most effective way possible to confront this rise in crime and to protect the people of our country. Sessions was sworn in after the Senate confirmed his nomination following a contentious confirmation process. Sessions was the first sitting U.S. senator to endorse Donald Trump for president. He faced criticism from Democrats over his record on civil rights and immigration. Republicans praised Sessions for his four decades of public service and his commitment to fairness and the rule of law. AP Update. I'm Ed Donahue.